cataractcoach.com. Limitations of the Alconvivity Extended Depth of Focus Lens. What have we learned after two years of using this lens? So I've used this lens extensively for at least two years. Lots of patience, a lot of early experience. I've made videos of it before, and I've been happy with it, but there's certainly some limitations. Let's set a little groundwork first. You see this picture over here, where I talk about depth of field, pupil size, refraction, and you see the two images. The one there says the narrow depth of field, and you can see that alarm clock or timer there, but the background's blurred, and the one next to it's the wide depth of field. And so why would you ever want anything less than the wide depth of field, right? Think about it. Ah, but this is a photo, and not real time like a video. And that's important because in these two pictures, they're taken with the same camera, adjusting the f-stop or the aperture of the camera. The shutter time was different. The exposure wasn't the same. So the one that has the wide depth of field lets in more light because it's a bigger aperture, a very short exposure. The one that's the narrow depth of field, the smaller aperture lets in less light, so it's a little bit longer exposure. And the camera does this automatically. You don't even realize it. But you have to think of what's the physics. The amount of light entering your eyes is going to be fixed, right? If you increase the depth of focus by making the aperture smaller, well, that'll certainly give you more depth of focus or depth of field. But you'll limit the amount of light entering the eye. Now, if you're outside, it's a bright, sunny day, there's abundant sunlight, it doesn't make any difference, right? There's so much sunlight, you can cut off 50% of the sunlight and still see well. I mean, think about it, the sunglasses you wear that you can still see fine out of, probably block 90% of visible light or more, and you still can see. Ah, but at nighttime, or when the vision, the pupils are dilated, you're trying to let in more light, now you don't want to wear the sunglasses, do you? No, of course not. So it's the reason why our pupils work that way, that we have larger pupils at night to let in more light, smaller pupils in the daytime to let in less light, and of course that gives us the benefit of a wider or deeper depth of field. Now we'll use the term depth of field, depth of focus almost interchangeably. Think about it though, depth of field is out in the field, like that's what patients think about. That's what photographers use to describe this, this phenomenon. But we also talk about depth of focus, which is in the eye. But don't worry, there's a little difference, but we'll use them pretty much interchangeably. Now, the catch with the Vividity is, it takes the incoming light, and it's going to spread that light over a wider range. And so instead of just having the one focal point, it expands that depth of focus. And that's great, but it comes at a cost. And that cost is contrast. Contrast is down, and there may be some little nighttime dysphotopsias that are more than we previously thought. So in terms of the contrast, think about it. If you're outside and you're looking with moonlight, you can't make the moon any brighter. So you can get 100% of those photons coming off the moon and have all of them go to your distance vision with a monovocal lens, and that's the best image quality. But if you get those incoming photons and you put about two-thirds of them, let's say, towards distance vision, and you put a third of them towards that intermediate range, that's kind of like the Vividity lens. And so you can imagine the ultimate far distance is compromised a little bit, in fact, significantly so. So much so that Alcon now has a warning in their patient information and in their brochure, the instructions for use that tells the surgeon, you better explain to the patient that you're gonna have a little bit less contrast at night. And that can be very significant Again, as it says in the warning there. And we'll get to that a little bit later in the video. Now let's talk about pupil size versus the IOL optic. You know, the central two millimeters or so of that Vividity lens has a special beam shaping element that helps elongate that depth of focus. Now if the patient has a two and a half millimeter pupil and this thing is 2.2 millimeters, 80% or more of the central optical zone that comes in the eye is going to be modified by that extended depth of focus element. But if the patient has a larger pupil, four and a half, five millimeter pupil, then a much smaller percent. And that's also going to change the patient's function, but also the refractive outcome. If we're only in that central part of the optic when patients have small pupils, and we aim for a plano outcome, they may end up a lot more myopic than we think. As opposed to patients with larger pupils, where we aim for a Plano and they get pretty close to Plano. But even besides that, there are some patients in my own practice where you've aimed for a perfect Plano outcome, 
You're sure of the lens calculations? It's an average eye. All the different formulas kind of agree, so you're pretty sure you can hit that Plano target. But the patient ends up myopic. And so this is a function, of course, of patient healing, patient anatomy, effective lens position, but it's also a function of the optics of this lens. And so you've got to be careful with the vividity lens. You can, in a certain number of patients, a significant portion, get a little bit of a myopic outcome. So it'd behoove you to do one eye first, do the vividity lens, see what outcome you actually get. And if it is a little myopic, then that's okay. That gives a little bit more reading. And then adjust, take that healing into account or the refractive outcome into account to make the second eye closer to Plano. So adjust the lens cuts. Learn from the first eye in order to hone the results on the second eye. And then finally, let's talk about which patients are ideal for the vividity lens. I've learned a few things. Number one, the patients who are going to do great with the VVD lens are the ones who already have a compromise in night vision. This picture over here is from a different lens company that has a competing lens with the VVD, and they just did a demonstration of putting a VVD lens inside a camera, taking a photograph through it, and you can see there's a little compromise there in the night vision at the distance and the intermediate range. So if you have a patient who already has issues with night vision because of the cataract capacity or bad posterior subcapsular cataract that causes a lot of glare or a lot of glare from a cortical cataract, those patients, the vividity is going to be a big improvement. And that's a good thing. So think of it this way. If a normal eye like your eye or my eye, nighttime we see beautifully, that's 100% of nighttime vision, well, maybe the vividity is going to give us like 70% equivalent, just estimating. But if the patient has a cataract that's already poor, bad and, and very much affecting night vision, and their night vision is, let's say, the 20 or 30% level, they're going to be thrilled. It's going to be a huge improvement. But when you're doing a refractive lens exchange, you've got to be a little more cautious because you are going to be trading some of that image quality and contrast in order to get a little bit more range. So be careful there. I think patients who also do very well with this lens are ones that have normal eyes, a normal clean cornea, no irregularity, a good ocular surface, and a nice, pretty, pristine macula. There was some talk early on about maybe this is a good lens. If you can't put a trifocal lens on the patient because of a compromised cornea or compromised macula, you could still put in an extended up to focus lens like the Vividi. Uh, I'd be a little more cautious. I think patients who have any compromise in the cornea or in the optic nerve or in the macula probably are going to be best off with a straight monofocal lens to prioritize getting that best image quality onto the retina. Patients who have perfect macula, perfect cornea, everything looks great, and good pupil size, not too small, I think those patients can have a very nice outcome with the vividity. Now, if they do have a very small pupil, you can still put the vividity in, Aim, make sure you aim for a little hyper because those patients you know are going to end up a little myopic. So if you aim for plus a half or plus 75 even, maybe they'll end up closer to Plano. And those patients will be very happy. Plus they already have the small pupil that gives them a little bit more depth of field anyway. So I think it's a good lens that we have. There are competing extended up to focus lenses in the U.S. We have the Symphony lens from Johnson & Johnson. And that one uses diffractive rings, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this video, in order to give that little bit extended range. And then now we have the AccuFocus IC8. That's a lens that has a small aperture. Now keep in mind, that lens is designed to be placed in usually the non-dominant eye, or one eye. Because placing in both eyes may really compromise the night vision, because you're left with a very small, functional 2 millimeter pupil or so, even at night. And that can make nighttime vision a little bit tougher. Now, ophthalmologists frequently use these two words interchangeably, depth of field and depth of focus. Well, they're actually different. Depth of focus is within the eye. Depth of field, as the name is, uh, sounds, is out in the field. And so for us, when we talk about depth of focus, the patient's more interested in the depth of field. They want to know what's the range that they'll be able to see without glasses. And this extended depth of focus lens does increase that depth of field for our patients. And they're getting an increased intermediate zone in particular. So instead of having a near point of about a meter, that's brought into about 60 or centimeters or so. And that's helpful to increase their range. Let's look at a few examples here. On the left is Plano, light focused right on the retina. 
The second one over is minus 150 myopia, and the light's focused in front of the retina. The third image is our patients with mixed astigmatism. These patients often go around most of the day without any glasses, and that's because there are two distinct focal points, one at plano and one at minus one and a half. But there is the associated blur around that. And on the right is the ideal extended depth of focus lens. And this gives a very clean focusing range of zero or plano to minus 1.5. And that'd be a very, very suitable lens for most of our patients. But of course, that's ideal and theoretical. It doesn't really exist. Here's a small aperture lens, and that does increase the depth of focus, but it does it by blocking the peripheral light. So we have loss of light due to that pinhole effect, and that's a compromise. The Tecna Symphony lens is a diffractive extended depth of focus lens, and it splits the light to give us that wider range, again from Plano to about minus 1.5, but it does induce halo and glare due to the diffractive rings. The Alconvivity is a beam shaping lens, so it alters the wavefront of those central light beams that come into the eye to give a little bit larger extended depth of focus, but it comes at a cost of loss of contrast. So in the FDA clinical study, which I've listed here, you can see it's about one line better in immediate vision and one line better near vision. And that's of course with both eyes corrected for 2020 for both monofocal and vividity. But remember, it does decrease contrast. And here is an image showing about 20 to 30% decreased contrast. And this is an estimation, of course. But the package insert from Alcon also states that there will be a loss of contrast. Looking at the modulation transfer function here on the left, you can see there is some contrast loss, but we do gain an increased depth of field or depth of focus. And then similarly, with the defocus curve, we can see that increased depth of focus that we achieve by using this wavefront shaping. So, a lot of options here. I'm glad we have more and more of these options in our toolbox. But ultimately, at the end of the day, still, I think, your best option, if you want pristine image quality, the best image quality that we have is to stick with a monofocal lens. Yeah, you'll still have to put on reading glasses, let's say, if you aim for sharp distance vision without glasses. Then you'll put on readers to see up close to computer work or your cell phone. But it's a pretty reasonable trade-off. And that gives us the best quality vision and yeah, we put on some readers, and I'm okay with that. If it was my eye, I probably would stick with a monofocal lens. And for me, as you know, I'm a natural myop, I'd probably still choose a little bit of a myopic target. And I've done surgery on many ophthalmologists, and to date, more than 90% of them have chosen a monofocal lens. And often with a little bit of a myopic target. Very few have chosen to have an extended depth of focus lens in their own eyes, or a trifocal lens in their own eyes. So keep that in mind as well. We know ourselves, we as ophthalmologists, we are sticklers for the best image quality, and we don't want to sacrifice that. And for us, wearing glasses is no big deal. You know, if I have to put on glasses to drive at night, I don't mind, as long as I have great vision here for my activities. So ultimately, at the end of the day, use all the lenses. They're all great. You want to have them in your armamentarium so you can offer the right choice to the right patient. Tailor your surgery to the patient and you'll end up with very happy patients. So yes, Vividity is a nice lens. It's not a perfect lens. It's not for everyone. And the patients have to have very reasonable expectations in order to be happy. Thanks for watching.